Okay, we're, we're running a little late, so we're going to um, make this transition very quickly. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, Bud Albers, who's uh, pre uh, President of Interactive Technology Strategies and uh, former Executive Vice President and CTO of Disney. And Bud's going to be talking to us a little bit about the innovation uh, and the cloud, thoughts on where we've been and where we're going. So uh, another sword forward looking uh, theory set to compare against the other two we've gotten. And uh, with that, Bud, please uh, welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Usually I do these without a, a microphone here at all, so this is actually a treat for me. If I, I don't even have to uh, yell. Let me find the, the clicker. I guess this is it. Everybody get in okay. Hopefully I won't put anybody to sleep. But uh, as he said, most recently, prior to setting out on my own, I was the EVP and CTO for the Walt Disney Company, pretty much focused on all of their internet, mobile, and gaming pieces. And that includes some small brands, obviously, outside of Disney, like ABC, ABC News, ESPN, okay, and dealing with busy Sunday afternoons with ESPN when your wives are taking you out shopping and you're on your mobile phone checking the scores, right? Busy Sunday afternoon, when everything's smoking hot and running, we would have oh, roughly 500 million pages viewed in a day, which is a pretty, pretty healthy size. And so one of the challenges always comes back to how do you actually deal with that versus how you deal with normal flows and balance, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I've been fortunate enough to be involved in a number of leading edge things over the course of my career. I had prior some of the things I did prior to ESPN were building Getty images pretty much from the ground up, if anybody knows that. Worked for a startup where I ran most of the operations strategy and technology and actually launched a number of the music services like AOL, uh, AOL Music, Yahoo Music, MTV Urge, uh, Microsoft Zoom. Okay, anybody going to chuckle? I actually was still listening to my Zoom flying in last night until I got in here about one in the morning. Okay. So I've done a number of things along those lines. Got into this internet space back in 1995. So I have, uh, have been in and, and through and around it and have seen a lot of different things and have been fortunate enough to do a lot of different things, including now I'm both advising and consulting to a couple of young PaaS companies that are in the computer reseller news, cool, you know, cool 20 companies that they, uh, they do. So I'm seeing a little bit of this market and also have helped advise a couple of different major venture capital firms. So I've, I've kind of covered a lot of different spectrums on this. I'd spent most of the 90s in the enterprise software space and to which, okay, somebody's gonna have to tell me which way I'm pointing this and, all right, this is, this is a first. My wife would get a kick out of this. I can't figure out how to work the remote control. All right, so Carla, you're gonna to have to tell me if this is it or what I'm, uh, what I'm hitting or if so. Sideways? All right, she's got me being saved here, hopefully. Ah, there we go. This one's to the left, this one's to the right. All right. Okay, great, super, super. See if I can get this get this right or wrong here again. Well, we still may not be there. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, okay. All right. I always, always joked I could take your, uh, your operating system apart, but I can be confused by simple office machinery, and this is still not working for me. Might even work better if I'm back here. Okay. There we go. All right, I can do it. I can figure it out. My apologies. One of the, uh, the things here is we look at talking about what's coming next and what makes some sense is Bill Gates actually said this. Now, in, in pretty true to form, I'm sure he actually took it from somewhere else. I just don't know exactly where that is right now. But it's actually very, very true when you stop and think about it, and particularly when you apply it to, to this market. So what we always thought, at least back in 1999, right in the bubble, that, oh my God, everything's gonna change in the next two to three years. Well, it didn't, it actually crashed, but it took, over the course of the next decade, if you look at it, the core internet has really come of age, and so of the associated technologies, and that's really what we've been talking a lot about here today. I mean, if you think about it over the last 10 years, we now Facebook things, right? We didn't a decade ago. Google has become a verb. 
If you think about what, what the space is actually doing, I think the last quarter Amazon passed Best Buy in earnings. Okay, if you think about it, Amazon has no physical stores. Best Buy, if you think about where they have to go and some of the challenges inherent for them, they've got more than 4,000 stores and 50 million square feet under roof. Okay, so reinventing this, we've seen a complete disruption in media and print. I've, I've actually been part of that between Getty, Disney, and the music business, seeing a ton of this go upside down, and, and in many ways, things that we thought were icons are now out of business. And so as these continue to change, these trends continue to affect a number of the things that you're involved with and will continue to drive things forward. I mean, if you look at it, YouTube didn't show up until 2005, right? That's a seven-year-old technology base that now actually takes, what, one hour of video every second? So if a baby is born right now and lives to the average U.S. age of somewhere around 80 years of age, over the course of the next eight days, if that infant did nothing but sit in front of a video monitor, which I've occasionally accused my son of, that uh, fundamentally there'd be nothing else for them to do in eight days but watch everything that was uploaded on YouTube. Maybe that's slightly more depressing than network television, but maybe not. And you look at wireless connectivity, we have gone from about 5% handling broadband in 2000 to roughly 80% by the time we hit 2007. So there's a pace that continues and moves and continues to change. We're reinventing the user interface with things now like Connect. We've gone to haptic touch. 1999, anybody out here using open source? In 99, okay, so you guys were on the very, very leading edge of that. In, uh, I spent the last 12 years of my life living about 12 miles or 12 minutes north of the Redmond campus. The thought that people would give away software there was pretty anathema in 1999. Social networks have emerged and mobile is still going to be the fastest growing thing. If you think about where we are from a, a, a growth perspective and how it'll impact the businesses from both the vendor side as well as the end user side, you're at a point where about 30% of the world is currently on the web in one form or another. 86% have mobile phones. So if you think about where that goes in terms of growth over the next decade, it's a pretty long, long view. And in 2006, Amazon released EC2, right? And so if you think about where we will progress now and where that is, it's still in an awkward adolescence. And I'll talk about, as you, you think about where we are and some of the planning horizons that we've got, what are the important pieces that you actually really need to, to be thinking about to deal with the pace, and really what is speed? I'm sure none of you have ever been asked to go faster, right? Speed is, is totally not important, right? I, everything I would hear at Disney and everywhere else is faster. We've got to be first. You've got speed. It's got to be there. You've got to drive it. And there is absolutely some truth to the pace, but it's more about when you look at the amount of change that happens, it's more about anticipation and timing. My son, you can't get into any discussion about that without, a, without the Wayne Gretzky quote, right? Skate to where the puck is going to be. And my oldest son is an NCAA hockey player, so I've spent a lot of time in and around this, and it, it, there are some parallels really when you think about the planning and the direction and, and where you're going to go and, and what has to happen. The first of which is absolutely terrific, tremendous player, but most teams, as with most businesses, as with most vendors, you're playing within what I would call a system. It's what's your culture, how does it work for you, are you an early adopter, how do you play it out? Right within that, but on the but when you get to the ice, the principle always is read and react, and you're doing that whether you're on the vendor side, and you're dealing with the markets and rapid change in the markets and the pace that you've got to keep up with, or whether you're doing it from an internal IT perspective and trying to figure out, okay, where is this going? How's it happen? When am I? When do I need to be there? Where do I need to be? Because as is true in this game, you lose if you move at the wrong time. Right? If you aggressively charge in. They'll just simply reverse the play and it goes out the other side. Okay, so you have to fit it to within the system that you're comfortable with. And as always, if you're really good at it, you take advantage of the opportunity. And one of the best books for a technologist, and this is an oldie but a goodie, Crossing the Chasm, we talk about playing within the system, is truly understand where your business is, what's your tolerance for risk, where do you fit in that ecosystem. 
If you're, you know, what are your capabilities, really? You know, is this something, are you able to take something at the very, very early edge of the curve and actually really do something with it? Or is your business not comfortable with that? If you're more to the middle of the market, okay, do I have to have all the support and the services and those pieces with it? So early and where you are in that planning cycle, really you've got to weigh your risk and what you're comfortable with. On the vendor side, you're looking for those early customers and you're probably looking at early adopters and many of whom are probably in this room at this conference trying to figure this thing out where it's going to go for the, the next period of time. And one of the big challenges we have today in the middle of all of this is cutting through the noise. Right? Anybody, how many, just for a show of hands, how many guys are on the vendor side? Okay, it's mostly what I've got here. Okay, don't try to sell me anything. I don't have a budget right now. Okay, and, and the rest of you who are on the end user side. And one of the things, either which way, whether it's competitive or whether it's on the IT side, is trying to cut through the noise. There's a ton of publications, a ton of hype. We get much, much more input than probably is even valuable. And things get hyped to no end. But the truth of the matter is, you've got to learn to read for the trends filter out the noise and drive more toward a long-term solution because I, as this came out, this concept is really well laid out in a book called The Next Hundred Years by a, a gentleman by the name of George Friedman who is the chairman of Stratfor, is one of the shadow CIA as it's referred to. But the, the truth of the matter is if you can ignore the hype, things actually follow a much more predictable arc over time. So from an anticipation and a timing perspective, if you're looking at where things are going, it is a more predictable playing field in, in the long view than it is in the short view. Issues around corporate governance, new product releases, new feature releases. I've been traveling, so I haven't had a chance to look at all the things that came out, for example, of Apple's WWDC. But not everything that's been hyped and written on is really going to make that much of a difference, right? It's much more evolution in many cases than it is actually doing something significant. And so if you think about what it is you're focused on and follow it over the long course and the long curve and you read for trends, you're in a much better position than you would be otherwise. And as you look at the markets, there actually are very, very few new quote unquote inventions. All right, the technology itself changes and it evolves. And I'll separate here, when you look at the things to make the products work between technology markets and the commercialization and the development of those features, there are very, very few things that actually fall in the invention bucket. Those don't happen that often. Most of what happens are continued innovations, continued changes, and moves of products toward markets that make sense. Actually launching a product that really, really actually makes a difference as opposed to the invention. There are a number of the great inventors that have died poor. And it's the innovator that grabs the product, meets the needs of the market, that actually drives to commercial success. In fact, I would say that in terms of new inventions, most of the things that are going to have a significant impact on the back half of this decade are already here in some form or fashion. You may not recognize them yet in the way that they look, in the way that they're set up, but they're already here. Case in point, things take a long time. New inventions often mimic the things that have come before. You think about the initial launch of, of television, right? The very first shows on television actually mimicked radio, all right? If you think about the very first things that went into EC2, all right, the earliest cloud plays, pretty much looked like virtualization of your data center dumped into a public forum or a startup, many, many pieces. There'll be some disagreement, that's okay. Well, you know, there, there are some new pieces of technology, Hadoop being one, right? But as you look at where things go, these arcs tend actually to take time. Now, things are speeding up from where we were when we invented television. But actually, 75 years after passing through the first moving images over the wire, there were only 200 television sets out in the US. Okay, So it's a matter of what is that curve? How does it work? And being first in the market doesn't guarantee success. So we look at it 
We talk about the, the IPO of Facebook and all the noise it's made recently. It wasn't the first social network. Salesforce was not the first CRM system, and there were a few search engines before we hit Google, right? It's a matter of, again, the commercialization, the timing, meeting the needs of the market. And another, another perfect case of this, if you go back and you look, and this is littered throughout history, you look at the automobile. You know, 15 years before Henry Ford actually produced the first automobile that was meaningful, there was the first actual production car, the Duria. How many of you drove up in your Duria today? Well, you know, it takes a while, and these things evolve over the course of time, and it oftentimes is the cult of personality that will break things loose. I mean, Henry Ford's one of my, my favorites, right? And it is the vision of the innovator, no less than the vision of the inventor, Although the passion of the innovator is much more about bringing products to market that are meaningful as opposed to the invention and the science behind it. And if you look at Henry Ford, I love the quote about faster horses, right? You've got to have the vision and you've got to carry it forward and most of all, you have to have the cult of personality and that makes a ton of, ton of sense, particularly in this business. If you look at the last 20 years in compute, Basically, you've had some very dynamic personalities that have driven innovation. I made fun of Bill Gates earlier. He's certainly one of the, the two principles, right? Gates was a, uh, another passionate individual who was able to turn a very large company on its head and meet some challenges. And the other, we'll talk about in a second here, is Mr. Jobs. Initially, after the technology breaks through, there's kind of a Rubik's Cube period, and I think we're a little bit in that space right now as it relates to the cloud and to PaaS, and figuring out, okay, what's the right market offer? Do I meet the needs of the market? Is it, is it an IT offer? Is it internal? Is it public? And there's gonna be a lot of iterations. And again, how you decide and how your customers decide to participate in that actually depends on the customer, where they are in their life cycle, what they're comfortable with, and where it needs to evolve to. And once you get to a spot where this can begin to play and interact with other systems, other markets, you can get explosive innovation, right? And explosive market presence and new capabilities actually arise. And a good, good portion of them, again, driven by the cult of personality and thinking differently and having that vision about how things come together. Jobs is a very interesting character for our times. As you might imagine, I went from launching most of the music services that competed with Apple to working for Disney, where Steve, Uncle Steve, was our largest shareholder. Made my life a little bit interesting from time to time. But even when as much revolution as he gets for the iPhone, or as much credit and, and hype as we've seen go through with the iPhone, that was a device 15 to 17 years in the making. And a lot of the true breakouts that actually drove that thinking spun out of Apple in a company called General Magic in 1990 bunch of Apple engineers that were put adrift by Scully, okay? And eventually one built on the other, PDAs collapsed, music players collapsed, we drove in, and ultimately he innovated to find the right combination in the right markets. The same was true as I, I've talked to most people and they said, well, Apple invented the music player. Actually, the first music player was patented back in 1981, and 20 years later, we released an iPod. So again, these things, as we look at where we are in this, in this particular evolution, right? I mean, we, we can talk about the mobile phone. When was the first time you heard it's the remote control of our lives? It will be the remote control of our lives. That was going on for a long time. It's been a fairly predictable cycle over the arc. Again, hype, a lot of press. You gotta read through for the trends as opposed to dealing with just every announcement and where things are, because what, what winds up happening is you get back to that dialogue around speed. And in terms of, of true speed, I think what happens with a lot of the, the hype in the press is I'll take it back to a Disney analogy. When I was at Disney and working a little bit with the guys at Imagineering, you've got the rides and you want the sensation of speed, but there's only so much speed you can produce while, while keeping the customer safe in the park, right? So you do different things, you create different effects, different visuals, different wind effects and others to give the illusion of greater speed. Once in a while I think that actually works in the same way when we're dealing with the press and trying to figure out what's going on and where we're going. We get a lot of hype, but what happens is things do progress over the arc 
And you do get a lot farther over time, over 10 years, than you do in that, in that short term. So we'll talk a little bit. I'll just give you a few of my opinions on where we're going to go from here and the things that I see. And I didn't, wasn't able to collect and, and connect with all of the presentations today. So let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the trends that are going to drive that, the Internet of Things, right? My corollary to the dumb things get smart and smart things get connected is that connected things generate a lot of data. And in fact, I used to say at Disney on one of those Sunday afternoons when we generated 500 million pages that we probably generated more data than the Walt Disney Company did in the first 70 years of its existence. And that, that will certainly be true here. And I think we have yet to develop the, the paradigms fully and get our minds around what those things are going to mean and getting into a spot where PaaS is the first step in laying that foundation because most data centers aren't going to be equipped to handle these kinds of things. We're going to need to do it at a massive scale. And ultimately, the whole big data phenomenon will be really give way to predictive analytics, right? Human beings sub-optimize when given too many choices. They can't process that much data. And algorithmically, we're going to have to narrow it down. And that means we're going to have to have massively scalable compute to do that, and compute that makes sense from a capital perspective as well. Things changes in other industries like television, where you are going to see, I think, the collapse of proprietary networks. More IP, more data. Advanced advertising models, more data. And even getting to the point where you've got the spike-driven nature. And one of the things I used to, uh, used to always live in fear of is throwing the whole data center over at Disney with a breaking news story. For example, if you remember when the plane went down here in New York in the Hudson, all of a sudden we see a massive spike because we're running all the live data, all the live feeds. It's been picked up by CNN. So here's WABC in New York, which by our standards is a pretty small website. All of a sudden we're pulling a tremendous amount of volume because one of the guys at WABC cut a deal with CNN and we're now pulling it directly off CN, over CNN.com and other things. We didn't get it to ABC News because they were fighting, okay? Welcome to large companies. But the, uh, the reality is you never know where those things are going to hit. So surges are and will continue to be a significant issue in an event. And then if you flip it to the other side, when I was at Disney, one of the things we had, it was an absolutely crazy environment because of all the impending things. If you think about when a media company launches a new property. You now have mobile games, you have console games, you have websites, you have social games, you have all of these things. What it led to was we were literally driving over two new code bases into our infrastructure every business day. And I found out that those don't go away, right? They never go away. In fact, I got a call, a panicked call one day because the Meet the Robinson site went down. Okay. I didn't even know that was still around. It was only 10 years old, but somebody, God love them, somebody cared. Okay, but once you get to the point of looking at that kind of wave into your data center in terms of measurement, right, 75% of my servers never got above 15% utilization in a month. And I would say that kind of thing is probably, to a greater or lesser extent, typical of many, many large data centers. And so we were, not only was that killing you, but what really killed you is the data center was constantly full and we're constantly doing build outs. Absolutely makes no sense. Terrible use of capital. So that's solved by virtualization, but that was only the very, very first step in there. That's only the beginning. The true issue then becomes we drove very hard on virtualization. In three years, we got to the point where we had 70% of the data center virtualized, only to come to a real realization that most of the true, big, hardcore, meaningful applications weren't touched by this. So as we look at cloud technologies, PaaS and others, and sometimes I just step over PaaS as part of the cloud because it seems like such a natural place for us to go, that what you find is after this first step, you now wind up really looking right down the barrel of how do I optimize and how do I deal with the stuff that really makes a difference in my business. For example, with that, we couldn't touch any of the fantasy sports with virtualization, right? So there is a very, very large play coming for dealing with big data, high-scale compute in a cloud and a PaaS environment. That's a pretty natural evolution, and if it's going to be meaningful, you've got to go there. 
And I think, you know, as I said, PaaS is moving in a fairly normal structure that'll help us commoditize those things and get to the spot where you've got the ability to isolate, you've got the ability to manage apps, not instances. And we started actually building a PaaS in 2009, very early of our own, because we didn't find anything out there that we really liked to try and figure out how to drive these things down. Ultimately, I think these things have to be an integrated public-private. And yes, there are challenges with how the data moves and the compliance and the scale. But again, if you look at it, we've got to move as an industry where the CIOs and the CTOs inside of an end user company are actually managing things much like they do the CDN capacity today and you're dealing with peak to average ratios rather than building 2x of max capacity where your boundary is to fail if it gets too big. So we need the ability to scale out. You're not going to get, for all applications, you're not going to get a brand like Disney and say, well, I'm just going to take everything to the cloud. You're going to have security issues and concerns and otherwise. And Personally, I never wanted to be sitting there trying to explain to the CEO of the company why Mickey and Minnie were doing that on the homepage. Okay, so that, that's always a, a balancing act. And it may be in those cases just as important to get small as it is to get large. Scale the instances out and retract them when you need to. Also, the acceleration of cost decline has to get steeper. And in some of the earlier, one of the, uh, the companies that I'm working with right now is bringing those kinds of cloud technologies into the genomics world. And we are seeing both with what they're doing as well as an industry-wide trend, things actually beginning to fall faster than average. So things have to scale, scale downward and scale downward very, very quickly or we're not going to be able to recognize the vision of getting to much larger pieces of data and move through it. Now, I'm running a little short on time here, but as we, we go through, the roles in the industry players, and most of you on the vendor side of this realize it. If you're a software player today, you're actually in the best shape. You're an arms merchant. If you're a cloud provider, you're looking for pure growth. But actually, if you're a colo player or an outsourcer, you've got a pretty big challenge in front of you in terms of what's going to happen. And that market is going to change. People are going to get bought. People are going to change their positioning. And things are going to move in a fairly aggressive fashion as this kicks up. And the last thing I will leave you with here really is that one of the other things that's happened over the last couple of weeks, this whole Stuxnet public attack thing, is you know, I, I go at back and forth on security. I'm always morally disappointed in all the, the things that can happen when you start dealing with security. But what it does call into question is when you look at where warfare has progressed over the last century, it's gone from mass destruction to surgical destruction, right? They can blow up the building next to you and not touch yours. Well, we're now bringing in, truly bringing cyber warfare to the front end. And as we look at what's going to happen in the public cloud, it will become a target. The ability to disrupt industry is real and will be, especially on a common infrastructure. And that's going to be a bigger and bigger concern as you move forward. So all of that having been said, thank you for enduring me here this morning. And I hope you enjoy the conference.